Men, I want to tell you something. I love ministering to men. Men are awesome. Men sometimes are the problem, but men are the solution, right? Men are the solution. I just spoke to a whole group of men at Teen Challenge, and we had some church on Friday night. It was awesome. Um, encouraging men, because sometimes as men, we get in this place where we, we can't see our own potential, but God wants you to see the potential that he has placed inside of you, and sometimes we just need encouragement. And here's what God has had on my mind. I believe wholeheartedly that what we're dealing with, we, it seems like the agenda of hell is coming against uh, traditional families. How many of you have slightly noticed it? Okay. Listen, I want, I want you to know something. I know a lot of pastors stay away from cultural issues, and that's their decision to do that. We don't say anything negative about them. Um, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, I, I can't help but to touch on the issues that you're talking about every day of your lives around the water coolers at work, in the neighborhood as you're talking to your neighbor, wherever you are. We're going to talk about the real things that are going on, and we're going to look at the hope that we have in Christ because we know that we're on the winning side. Quick story. A friend of mine, Dennis McDonald, just reminded me about when my brother Peter spoke at... Our, our men's, men's event that we had back at Coast Chapel, I don't know, Carl, if you remember that, but um, it was back probably, I don't know, uh, 25, 26 years ago, Peter gave this illustration. He said, if you were playing tennis and you knew that no matter what happened, you were going to win the tennis match. You absolutely knew. Like God said, you're going to win this. Wouldn't you try to do things that you've never done before? You might try a backhander. You might go under your leg. You might do a little twist like this. That must have looked really bad. Um, and, and you're just going to do everything because you know you're going to win. Same with if you had a basketball game, a little one-on-one, -on -one, you know, um, with, with the best basketball player you can imagine. Sorry about the Celtics. Don't even think about that right now. Um, and, and you just, like, you, you know you're going to win. You'd be doing three-pointers. You'd be doing layups. You'd be doing shots behind your back. You know you're going to win. Here's what we know as Christians. We are going to win because we are on the winning side. So we just keep looking forward as we're working through this life. We know that Jesus Christ is coming back. He's going to establish his kingdom because he is the king of kings. So what are we sweating it for? We already know where we're going and how it's going to end because we read the scripture. Amen? Okay, today... Uh, the. the the title of my message is Kids Need Their Dads. And I want to start out with um, uh, these little notes that kids had left for their dads. Okay, you ready for this? Dear Dad, can I take karate, K-A-R-A-T-Y? I promise I won't hurt you, H-I-R-T. I could fight off robbers, and fight is F-I-T-E. And it's great exercise-y. Can I do it? And then there's a blank. And then he goes, sign it to make sure. <laughs> He's got a little spot for him to sign. Here's another one. Dear Dad, this is from an older daughter. Dear Dad, February 12th through 24, I will be in Hong Kong. Here are two DVDs. There's a picture of Taken 1 and Taken 2. If I get taken, follow Liam Neeson's lead, <laughs> Love, Sarah. That's a great one, isn't it? Here's another one. Love dad. I mean, dear dad, why do you want to be a vegetarian? This is a little kid, little, little daughter. Did mom make you? If she did, you do not have to listen to her. She is not your boss. Yeah. Dad, now that another little kid, now that we are getting a little older and a little wiser, there's something I want to tell you. That's the front of the card. You open the card. I can totally take you in a fist fight. I'm coming for you, old man. Happy Father's Day. This is from a little kid at a school project, a little tiny, tiny kid. Um, it's like a school project they had to write about their dads. This is all the kid wrote. Ready? My dad have a big mole on his forehead. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, kid. 
hey, Dad, isn't it awesome that we don't have to say out loud that I am your favorite? And then the last one is, dear Dad, let's be honest, you wouldn't have this special day if it weren't for me. <laughs> That's true, right? It's true. Kids need their dads. I'm going to talk about three things. Um, kids need their dads as their prophets, as their priests, as their king. So you know that um, there were prophet, priests, and kings in the Old Testament. And each one of those were offices that they could not, if you were a king, you weren't a prophet or a priest. If you were a prophet, you weren't a king or a priest. So they, they, they all had separate offices, except for there's this story about Melchizedek, real quick, um, Genesis 14, where you see that Abram had gone to battle to rescue Lot, came back victorious, and it says in verse 17 of Genesis 14, after his return from the, the defeat of ched Olamir and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went up to meet him at the valley of Shava, and here comes this mysterious person, Melchizedek, who was he? King of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of the Most High, and he blessed, so he was a prophet. Blessed be Abram, by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the God Most High, who has delivered your, your enemies into your hand. What we see there is something highly unusual, and it is one man encompassing all three offices of prophet, priest, and king. Um, who, do you know who, that foresh who Melchizedek foreshadows? And possibly, as some scholars believe, was a Christophany or a theophany where there's Christ appearing in the Old Testament. I don't know if all of you knew that there's all these examples, the angel of the Lord especially, where Jesus appears, most scholars believe, I do, that he showed up because Jesus always existed. We, we, we don't think often about his pre-incarnate state. Before he was incarnated to become human, he, he was always God, and he also took on becoming full, fully man, fully God, fully man, all in one. But in his pre-incarnate state, Jesus was showing up from time to time. Pretty cool stuff. But... I believe that's either is a Christophany, Christ appearing in the Old Testament, or it's a symbol of Jesus uh, who later came to be our prophet, our priest, and our king. All right, so you see that in Hebrews 1, chapter 1, Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. You also see it in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is a prophet, priest, and king. He encompasses the threefold ministry there that we need, what we need we need all of those three ministries. How many of you know that? We need all three ministries. The prophet speaks God's word. Here, ready? Prophets, what do they do? They represent God to people. And they speak the word of God to people. How many, what would it be like if we, I think it's 60% of the word of God is prophetic. In other words, it's, or it's, uh, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, prophet. Prof prophetic word of God from the men of God that God chose to be his mouthpiece. Imagine if we didn't have the prophetic word of God. You wouldn't even know how it all ends. So much prophecy in scripture relates to end times. So we know and we can put our complete trust in the fact that Jesus will come back and establish all things. Prophet, priest, the priest on the other hand, he represents people to God. That's why they intercede. That's why they do sacrifice, to represent the people to God. And the, the king, under the headship of the ultimate king, is governing uh, the affairs, a lot of practical, provisional affairs that we do. So, you ready for this one? Ed Cole used to say this. Manhood and Christ-likeness are synonymous. You say, I want to know. I want to know what kind of man I should be. This book here about uh, that, that we're doing the, the uh, manhood stuff, I think it's on Monday nights, that basically says the same. We look to Jesus, and then we can learn how, what kind of man we ought to be. We don't have to be in the fog about how to be a man. So if you're a young man here, and you want to know, I want to become the greatest man I ever could be, then you need to understand what Jesus, 
what kind of man he was, and then we know exactly what we should do. Manhood and Christ likeness. So, because manhood and Christ likeness are synonymous, God has ordained it, I wholeheartedly believe, that we are prophets, priests, and kings in our household. When I say king, I don't mean I'm king and everybody else is my subject. Not at all. My wife wouldn't put up for that for one second, believe me. It's more like I am like Jesus in the way I love, in the way I show grace, in the way I bring the word, I bring the atmosphere and the presence of God. I initiate Christ's likeness in my home. You got it? You got it? Okay, let's look. We're gonna break down uh, kids need their dads as prophet, priest, and king. Let's look at the prophet. Everybody say prophet. Kids need their dads as their prophet, number one. And so as we, as every, every one of us guys, by the way, whether you're father or not, uh, some of you will become dads. We're so proud of our, our young adult men that are stepping into manhood. These guys in our church that are young, they have decided that the culture will not be the narrative that shapes who they become, but the word of God the, the Bible, the word of God is alive, it is powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. They have determined that this is how they're going to live. They're, they're looking at God's word saying, God's word is my sole source of faith and my absolute rule of conduct. Somebody say amen to that. So we've got some tremendous men of all ages, young and old. I love that we're multi-generational here. Because the older are mentoring the younger, and we learn a ton. I learn a ton, Miles, uh, from your generation. These guys are keeping me up, man. I mean, you know, Caleb tries to tell me how to dress all the time. He's like, Dad, we got to take you to the store, man. We got to go. I'm, I'm just teasing. But, but, you know, I learn from their insights into Scripture. And, they, and what I love about our young men is they're teachable, Listen, if you don't have a teachable spirit, I'm not going to mentor you until you do. Don't ever come to the table as a know-it-all. Come to say, I want to glean from all of you old dudes that used to have brown hair and used to even have hair. The glory of an old man is his gray head. The glory of a young man is his strength. So why did you guys look at Poe over there? That's terrible. They're looking at me, Poe, don't worry about it. As their prophet. So it, here's what's important. Is for us to feed on, to strive after every word of God. Man does not live by physical bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So what we do, our whole pursuit is, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom. The first thing you do, the first, number one, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness not a righteousness as it's defined by the culture. I don't care what a news agency says or what some Hollywood entertainer says or what some popular musician says. Their words need, mean nothing to me. If they are contrary to the word of God, I'll just take that stuff and put it right in the wastebasket because the only thing that brings me life and meaning and purpose is the very word of God. I'm 61. I've been relying upon it for most of my life. And I can tell you one thing. When you come under the authority of God's word, you will never want to go back and eat the vomit of yesterday. Some people are clapping. You're like, did he, did he just say vomit? The Bible says that, so we can do that. Um, so as their prophets. So what we do is we're, we're gleaning, gleaning, gleaning so that we can then be the prophetic voice to the culture, but we're talking to dads today, so that you can bring the word of God into your family so they will not be in a famine in your family. Your family should not be, have a famine of the word of God. There, it ought to be plentiful. It ought to be like a stocked refrigerator. I love it when my kids come over the house. They always open the fridge. But here's what I can tell you. The cabinets were always filled 
with the word of God, and we will continue to do that. And I'm so proud of you men that are, have stepped up in your lifetime. I'm so glad that there's leaders and life group leaders and so many guys that are saying, you know what, I missed it for years, but not anymore. Don't, don't, get, don't let the devil give you one second of shame over your past. Just celebrate the victories that now you're walking with Jesus and look forward to the future that you have in Christ. Can I, all right, because that's... So it's important for us as men to personally learn and keep growing in the word. Stay in small groups. If you don't, if you have not joined a small life group, get in one. It's so important. Or maybe you're getting ready to lead one. Lead one if you've been trained by Pastor Adams in his class. Um, You know, don't let your wife be the one that gets all the kids ready for church and you're just letting her do it and some days, hey, I'm just gonna stay in, honey. No, 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 God has called you to be a strong leader spiritually. Don't be a wimpy spiritual leader. Don't take the back seat. Think about, we're talking about eternity at stake. What is more important than sports, golf, jobs, your lawn, anything else, than the spiritual health of your family? Why would you take the lead on everything else but not that? And don't feel condemned over it if you haven't. It's time now, whether you're a grandfather or a dad, to step into it. Just just forget about condemnation over the past. Step into it now. I think I've made that point very clear. Do you know that um, uh, in 93%, everybody say 93%, of the cases where men lead spiritually, the whole family follows Christ. Those are not the same stats, and they've done this research all all the time, as when women first come to Christ. It's a lot lower, and that's nothing against women, but God has called men to be the head of the household. That's in the scriptures. That's not offensive or demeaning to women. Here's why. Because if Jesus is our head, then that means that we answer to him. And he has told us, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and laid his life down for the church and gave his life for the church to serve and all that. And so we're really, it's a real blessing that men are under the headship of Jesus. So don't let her be the one dragging to the church. I I polled a bunch of men this week to see you know, what are the top three concerns, men that are leading families with still young kids? One of the guys said, I, I, he said, years ago I was hurt at a church. I, I cooled off. I stopped, you know, being passionate about going to church. My kids weren't going to church. I realized that I was keeping my kids from what the Sunday school offers and the, and the community of faith that they can be part of. And I realized I was keeping them from that because I was holding on to a former hurt because of what somebody said or did to me. I finally got over that because the spiritual lives of my kids are more important than me nursing my wounds. So I forgave those who did what they did. And now I take the lead to get my three boys ready for church and get them right there happily and joyfully. And that's, that's awesome. He goes, share that with the rest of the guys. I think it's amazing. We can be very intentional. Very intentional. You know, don't you wish that there was like a book in the Bible that said, here's exactly what you should do with your sons, with your daughters. Almost like as if a dad were writing to his son about wisdom and all that. Don't you wish that was in there? How many? Raise your hand if you wish it. Guess what? It it is there. It's called the book of Proverbs. Everybody say Proverbs. It's Solomon the father writing to his son's sons, his sons and his son, you see son or sons often. And by the way, that same thing is there also for the daughters, right? It's, um, so so if he, a lot of times, yeah, the, the masculine term is used, but so much of scripture is meant also for all, sons of God sometimes means humanity. Just make sure you understand that. Um, but look at, open up to Proverbs chapter one. It's, it's really interesting here to see what is the book of Proverbs. Besides pithy points that pack a powerful punch. I dare you to say that with me right now. One, two, three. Pithy points that pack a powerful punch. That's what Proverbs. But who is it written to? Look at this. Let's figure it out. Chapter 1, verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. He equally values her teaching. 
Verse 10 of chapter 1. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. He gives warning. Stay away from those kind of people. Bad company corrupts good morals. Verse 15. My son, do not walk in the way with sinners, with, with, um, with them, violent people. And then um, chapter 2 begins. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commands with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom, blah, blah, blah. He talks about the benefits of what comes from that. Chapter 3, he starts out, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Chapter, chapter 3, verse 11, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Sometimes we get all upset if God's disciplining, me, disciplining us. But listen, when God disciplines, it's proof that he loves us. If you don't come under the Lord's discipline, then you're not loved. So how many of you guys have been disciplined? Hand bait mine nice and high, right? So that's because God loves you. He always means it for our good. So all over and over, um, verse 21, my son, do not lose sight of these. Uh, keep sound wisdom. Verse Chapter 4, verse 1, hear, O my sons, a father's instruction. Uh, chapter 4, verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 20. Chapter 5, verse 1. I have it all highlighted in my Bible. All the way to chapter 31. He is writing to his children. He's intentional as a dad. He is making, he wants to be the prophet, the, the prophet, the prophetic voice in his children's life. He is the one that wants to be the one that represents God to his kids, meaning they get the word. They're not gonna be undernourished. They're not gonna have a famine of the word. You can be very practical about this, guys. How many of you guys like practicality? You know, if you take the, just take the book of Proverbs. There's 66 books of the Bible. Just start with Proverbs, right? And you can go through it. It's 31 chapters. You can cycle through it every month and teach your kid about finances, about avoiding violence, about avoiding debt, how to manage money. I mean, it's all such practical stuff. Everything, it's, the Bible covers everything. So it's important for us to be intentional about being practical in everyday life. We need to create these times where we, our children get the prophetic word because it gives them hope and encouragement and direction and they know and they get guidance. So here's five ways to be their prophet. You ready? Teach them, encourage them, warn them, ground them, direct them. Okay, let's move on. No, I'm kidding. Let's talk about it a little bit. Number one, teach them. Five ways to be their prophet. My father used to make the most of every moment in the car. He would just like be driving and talking and telling us all, you know what apologetics are? It's defending the, the faith, defending the inerrancy of the word of God. He told us why you can trust the word. He gave us all these scientific things and reasons why you can trust that God is a creator. You know, people have a critical attitude toward a Bible that they never read. <laughs> what do you think, two billion people are blindly following something because they're all ignoramuses? Uh-uh. The scriptures, all the validation, all of the evidence that surrounds that the Bible is trustworthy and valid, there's so many piles, mountains of evidence. That's why two billion people today, many of them absolute academics and intellects, follow the living God. Because God is alive and he is true and he is Ruling the universe. So, five ways. You gotta teach him. My dad make the most of every, he was dropping nuggets when I was seven and 10 and 12 and 15. And the other thing you gotta do is warn them. Warn them. Scriptures bring warning. We can't just not equip our children in this world. They need to know what the guardrails are. And it's a dad and mother's responsibility. I remember my, you know, everybody, has their own idea of what a PK is, a pastor's kid, right? Uh, we're blessed to have amazing pastor's kids. But I remember when the boys were little, I taught them from 1 Samuel about Eli and his sons. Anybody know the story of Eli and his sons? Eli was a corrupt priest, and the sons were taking advantage of the people in lots of crazy ways. And I remember they were in their bunk beds, and I'm like, let's talk about this, guys. Let's go over this. And after we did the devotion, I go, you can never be Eli's sons. Do you understand me? You can never be Eli's sons. And they were never Eli's sons because I warned them. Here's another thing. Ground them. Our culture is so confused. God's word is not confused. 
um, so confused about so much. I mean, listen, that shouldn't make us hate people or hate our culture. We should love the culture and just say, you know what? We know exactly what will encourage people that are confused. The word of God will help them to see that how God made them biologically and other ways is exactly what their identity is. And rather than uh, them not wanting to be how God made them and who they are, you can find absolute deep joy and gratitude when you discover that God made you that way and he will give you the power to live the way that he designed you. Come on, somebody. Just praise God for that, right? But it's our job to gr- Our job is to ground them in a very confused world. Listen, we're gonna be straight up here at New Hope in love with lots of grace, with lots of grace. I believe that right now, right now, men of God, it is our time. I think, Dave, a revival is coming for men. I, the Lord has been stirring my heart to recharge and re-energize men's ministry. That's how I started, you know, in the ministry. And it's time for all of us guys to say, let's band together because we're not just gonna, like I said last week, let the mama bears take, do all the work. We're gonna step in and use our, uh, our gifts and everything that, 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 that God made us to be to step in to our calling. Are you guys with me seriously? I believe, this is what I believe. I believe the next revival is going to include men of, young men and men of all ages stepping in to lead the way. Unashamed. Don't listen. Jesus said, do not fear man. Do not fear man who can destroy your body. Worst case is they can kill you. Is that encouraging? But fear him, that is God, who can destroy your body and cast your soul into hell. So why are we afraid? Every, listen, everybody I talk to agrees that the biblical worldview is the correct way to see things. But there's too many cowards that, and I don't mean to insult you, I'm not saying you're cowards. There's too many cowards in America that will not be voices. And I believe that the Spirit of God is raising up voices to speak to speak. You know, I did a whole service on how uh, every time Jesus cast out, when, when Jesus healed people that were mute, that couldn't speak, there was always a demonic spirit behind that. Do you know that when you read the Gospels? A literal demonic spirit every time somebody couldn't speak. So what Jesus did and I titled the message Free Speech because Jesus went around freeing speech when, every, when so many people, a lot of men in those stories, were mute. He unmuted them, and then they begin to use their voice to glorify God. And I feel like there's a demonic assault to mute you. Do not be muted. Unmute yourself in the name of Jesus. And make sure when these lips speak that they speak love, grace, and truth. All three combined. Do we got a deal? All right, boy, that's, that's a lot about the prophet. Um, ground them, direct them. I remember my dad was, was so, he was all about the word of God. His wisdom he would guide us, right? He would direct us. And I remember even he was spirit-led, which every Christian should be spirit-led. In other words, we're so filled with the spirit of God that we hear his voice, that we're in tune with what he's doing. So Gail and I broke up at 18 years of age. We broke up. It's a terrible, dramatic breakup. Um, <laughs> uh, we weren't married yet, easy, okay? And so I went and I, sadly, I, 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 I said, oh, I'll take this one girl out and I, Went on that date and it was so empty and I, got, I just did not enjoy, no, no fear of God, just so shallow. And I dated another girl and she didn't have the character that Gail had. She didn't have the godliness. I'm like, eh, yeah, it's not, it was a great time, but I'll see you later. And then the third time, I was so discouraged um, that, that I, didn't, I, I couldn't find the quality of somebody like Gail. And so I, I went home and I said, Dad, this is like stinks. This whole dating thing stinks. And um, he said, you know what? Right out of, he just said, you know what? I I really believe that God wants you to marry Gail. He was right, so I did. (laughs) (laughs) And my, I remember when my dad, when my dad died, Gail cried. And she brought up that memory. 
how much she loves and appreciates that my dad gave that wisdom. He had, he knew the word, he knew he could tell who would be good for his sons, and he, it mattered to him, and he stepped into it. By the way, guys, we've got to protect especially our daughters and our sons. You know, poor guys, I have two daughters, the poor guys, I put them through the mill. When they went to take my daughter out, we had the talk. And daughters, don't ever hate it when your dad has the talk. I know, what you, I know it's like, oh my, no, 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 dad. My daughters tried to stop me, but they couldn't because they were too precious to me. They were so valuable that I'm not gonna just let them go with any Tom, Dick, or Harry, if that's your name, don't be offended by that. It's just kind of a colloquialism. Um, it's my middle name, Tom, so don't worry about it. Um, and so we gotta direct them. So practical, let's be practical. We need to teach our kids, that's the prophetic. Proverbs topics are faith, hard work, sexual purity. Um, listen, right now, even Disney Plus, you can't trust it. Remember when Disney was an awesome place to go? Disney World, let's all go to, oh, Anyways, there's not a lot of safe places, but we've got to be very vigilant and diligent on what our kids listen to, what they're seeing on their iPhones. Um, but Proverbs talks about the fear of God, trusting God, managing money, um, debt, justice, marriage, wisdom, foolishness, poverty, blessings, correction, what God hates. All that stuff is covered. That's why there's short, pithy points that pack a powerful punch. You could go through with your kids and learn all that great stuff. You don't have to wait to be a dad. You can just do it as you are. Um, Second one, our, kids, our kids, uh, kids need their dads, and they need a priest. Everybody say priest. All right, what does a priest do? We're going to look at five things a priest does. He intercedes. When, remember, a priest is going to God, representing uh, his children on behalf of God. That's why, that's why it's important. Don't talk to your kids about God until you're talking to God about your kids. Go to God. Pray for them. Oh my gosh, I think Caleb put me on my knees the most of all my kids back in the day. Praying for him. We prayed for all of our kids. You know when we started praying for our kids? And I'm thinking about Miles and Kaylee right now. When Gail carried them in her womb, from the time that we knew we conceived, we started praying for our kids and their husbands and their wives. And we haven't stopped praying. And by the way, you all have added so many people to our list. We pray for five, we pray for 10 kids because they all are married, all five of them. And we pray for our 12 grandkids. I'll tell you what, some of those prayer nights are long winded. <laughs> um, Gail's like, when is this prayer gonna be over? <laughs> uh, as, as a priest, we, we intercede for them. That's the first thing. And intercede for your kids, pray for your kids. And then, second thing, guard them. Guard them in spiritual warfare. Do you know, it, we have to understand that we sometimes are under spiritual attack. Have you ever felt it in your family? There's strife, there's no, there's no like unity. You can sense all the drama. And you're going, you know what? Something more be, is behind this. There's a spiritual thing going on. And I, I can remember feeling that. And when everybody was sleeping, I was awake walking through my house praying over every one of my kids, praying in the spirit, praying in the understanding, just praying over my kids, my wife, my household, until I sensed the peace of God come. And I had to get up at 5.36 in the morning to go work. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let my tiredness sabotage the fact that I need to pray because I'm not gonna let some spiritual entity uh, mess with my, my family. How about this? Pray blessings over them. That's what a priest does. You, you just, as often as you can, this brings great encouragement. With all your heart, take each of your kids, or you, can, you don't even have to have kids to do this. You can do this with anybody. You can bless people because we are the priesthood of believers in the New Testament. And just speak the Numbers chapter 6 uh, blessing, or you can bless them in, in your own words as long as it's biblically focused. Bless people. That means, you know, speaking good over them and, and, and on behalf of God. You become God's representative to speak and pray good over them. And then, so not just pray blessings, but teach them to pray. Anybody ever hear that song, Talking to Jesus? 
Steve Furtick wrote it, but Brandon Lake sings it. Anybody know it? Raise your hand if you know that. Turn on to that. That's, that's quite a song. It talks about generational passing down of teaching kids how to pray. And it's called Just Talking to Jesus. Why do we make it all formal and weird? Just pray and talk from your heart. Just talk to God. We can come to God through Christ. You can talk to him about anything. And it's so therapeutic to do it. And then teach and show them God's grace. And please, avoid legalism at all costs. Be a loving shepherd. Avoid legalism. Teach them God's grace. Because, you know, so many times kids are like caught doing everything wrong. We catch them doing stuff wrong. But every once in a while, we ought to catch them doing something right. And they ought to hear that if you are disappointed in them, that you're also going to show them grace because Dads, we represent Jesus to them. Moms do too. And so what kind of memories are they going to have piled up of their past with you? Every little interaction builds memories in their minds. And I would say as much as you you teach them truth, teach them God's grace. Because we all mess up, don't we? Even your kids mess up once in a while. And then lastly... Um, kids need you as their king. And what do I mean by that? As a king, so Jesus is my king, and I'm, I'm governed by Christ. And so I need to represent Christ's uh, kingship in my family. It's not my kingdom. It's thy kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done. And so as king, here's, here's, here's what I want to say about kings, Okay. Every dad refuses to abdicate his role along with his, mo- his um, wife. I almost said mother. <laughs> I, mean, I was going to say their mom. Okay, got it? Um, along with his wife to manage the affairs of the family. Okay, this is important. This is where it gets real practical. Like we don't just expect our wife to manage the affairs. So we get involved in the money management we get involved in everything, but there's three points, to, there's three bullets for every kid needs their dad to be their king, to lead them because kingly work is leadership, to provide for them, and to protect. Lead, provide, protect. Say it with me. Lead, provide, protect. Um, lead them. How many of you know, like we, it seems to be a fact now that you can't trust the school system. Hold on. We have great teachers here at this church that are doing their best to honor God. And there are great administrative people in schools that don't want any of this curriculum. So let's just understand that so we don't curse the darkness. We need to pray for teachers, pray for schools, pray for administrators. But there are certain things that if I were raising kids right now, I wouldn't put them in most public school systems because the curriculum that's coming from White House down in through, just read the documents. Go ahead and read it all. Um, And so I wouldn't do that. So here's what we've done. We have been researching. Where's uh, Steve? Ann, is Steve here? All right, every time I look for Steve, he's he's in the back now. (laughs) I'm just teasing. Ann, can you stand up for a second? Um, Ann and her husband, Steve, along with Pastor Adam and other people, have been researching what the alternatives are for educating our children. So we've assessed and talked about different schools, different private schools in the area. Uh, we're talking to homeschoolers. And so we have come up with, and it's, it's so much of the work of uh, uh, the colonel, I call him colonel, he's running down now, just so you, you can see who, who we're talking to here. And Faith Doucette, is Faith in the house? Uh, She's an elder's wife. So what they're doing is they've been working really hard to figure out what are, there's a thing called school pods, and it's where churches like ours can can take all the experts on different subjects to help parents that decide to homeschool so we can all support each other and do it together. So they have made a proposal that I read, read and we're bringing it to the elders of the church and the pastors so we can provide for you alternatives and options because of all the fiery darts that seem to be coming against our kids. Listen, 
You have parental authority over your children. So we want to thank you for all that research. God has entrusted you, and that means that is no hatred toward any, anybody else, any other group. Do not say that we hate people. That is such a cheap way out of an argument. That is so wrong. We are people that love our community. But here's the thing. Parents have been given the design, divine assignment to have authority over their children. We do not surrender parental authority to somebody else to teach what we would consider garbage to our kids, things that are unbiblical, that do not have a Judeo-Christian worldview. Uh-uh, no, you went past the limits, not going to happen. And this pastor, I will not be intimidated or afraid to speak what I believe as a shepherd of this beautiful flock. I want to empower you, not just mama bears, keep doing what you're doing, but guys, we need to come alongside our wives and go into whenever these situations arise and keep people accountable that they cannot, hands off of my kids. Listen, I would encourage you, like we did anytime there was a sex ed class, we teach sex ed. We taught sex ed in our home. You, I don't let anybody else do that because it's always going to have their twists and their agenda. You teach sex ed in your home. I started teaching my, the triplets at nine years old. And wow, was that fun and awkward all at the same time. I was in the, one of the bedrooms and I start talking about it. And yes, I used a well, I won't tell you. Yes, I used a lamp with a light bulb, okay? You can get the picture. This is how it works, guys. That was my best way of doing it. And so we explained it to them. The reason I told them at nine years old is because the, the Carter twins in Pembroke told me about the birds and the beasts from their twisted, perverted point of view. And I'm like, you can't have my kids. I'm going to teach them. And so I'm teaching and talking about it and doing the demonstration with the light bulb and everything. And I, I, I'm looking for Ben and he's nowhere to be found. He slipped himself up under the comforter and I can see this big bump in the middle of the bed because he could not handle it. <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> you get it? God has called us to lead them. He's called us to provide for them. He's called us to protect them. Solomon's trying to protect his son from violence, protect his son from death, protect his son from sexual immorality. That's what the book is about. And he's teaching his, his boy and no doubt his girls. We need to teach them. Step up to the plate, man. Roll up your sleeves. There's work to do. And it's awesome because the family gets bonded together when we pray together, when we talk together. And listen, young people, listen to your parents because they have wisdom. You might not think they know anything, but that by the time you hit 40, you're going to be like, they knew everything. Hopefully. <laughs> well, um, I want you to, I want to close with this. Let's just, let's just stand and recite the Lord's Prayer together, okay? We're going we're gonna to close out this way. Stand and recite the Lord's Prayer together. Um, I want you to know something about the Lord's Prayer. We are not saying it ritualistically. Deal? Raise your hand. We're not going to say it ritualistically. We're going to say it relationally. Because Jesus said, here's how you pray. You want to know how you pray? He said the pagans, they babble on with all kinds of stuff. Here's how you pray. He's your dad, our father. That's his person. He's your dad. You know, other, two other places in the Bible, Paul the Apostle says, the Spirit of God helps you to see that you're a child of God, so you can call God Abba. Abba is a very personal, intimate term because God wants you to know that he's looking for a relationship and you may have been deprived of a good father. Maybe you had an abusive dad. Maybe you, your dad abandoned you. Maybe your dad... Um, didn't protect you. Maybe your dad didn't teach you and you feel like an orphan. I'm here to tell you something. I'm going to repeat Jesus. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. Jesus, in, in the gospel world, there is no orphans because Jesus connected us with our heavenly father who wants a real relationship with his kids. So there's no daughters in the kingdom that are orphans. There's no sons in the kingdom that are orphans. We have the dad of dads. We have the father of fathers. He is there for everyone. And so when we pray, we declare you're my father. 
We declare that this father is the perfect dad that will not abandon, he will not abuse, he will not molest. This father you can trust because he's hallowed. We hallowed be his name because we reverence his name. He gave us the purpose. He said, pray this way, that your kingdom, oh God, will come. That gives you great hope. The kingdom of God is finally going to come, but it's already come if he's in your heart because the king resides in your heart. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's the purpose of God, the Father. The provision is you don't ever have to worry about providing for your children because you have the ultimate Father that will provide for you. No, he won't meet your daily greeds, but he will meet your daily needs, right? So we don't pray for greed, we pray for needs. And then, I love this, this father is a pardoning father. He pardons you. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then, he's a protecting father. Lead us not into temptation, God, but deliver us from this evil. Deliver us, Father. Oh God, deliver us from the evil assaults that are arrayed against us with drugs, with all kinds of infiltration of, of people that want to indoctrinate our children. Deliver us, oh God. We could see a revival. We can see a revival in our nation. So we're going to pray that prayer knowing his person, his perfection, his purpose, his provision, pardon, and protection. Let's pray it as, and, and really mean it. Here we go. Let's talk to God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. By the way, earth is where we are. God wants to invade your life right now. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. If you love your Father in heaven, just say amen.